Sing to the Lord all the whole earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Amen. Please be seated. So it is finally here. The sun is going down and it is Christmas. We are free to wish each other a Merry Christmas for the next 12 days at least. And we can, without any guilt, move from singing Advent carols to the Christmas carols that we know so well. I wanted to open my sermon with that line from Psalm 96, with its call to sing a new song, specifically because psalms and singing are so closely tied to most of our Christmas traditions. There is probably not a single church service tonight that will not include the singing of Silent Night. It just wouldn't be Christmas without it. Even our secular celebrations of the season are, in large part, tied to songs. The radio stations switching to 24-7 seasonal music, malls and stores piping in non-stop covers of carols, and kids' songs like Rudolph and Frosty all sing at least a passive recognition that it is Christmas. However, in the song, we are told to sing a new song. And when was the last time you heard a truly new Christmas song? Now, the new song referred to in the song is actually the news of the gospel, which was certainly new when it was first heard. But in both cases, the gospel and Christmas music, when was the last time you heard something really new? It's hard when you're so familiar with something for it ever to be new again. Familiarity leads to comfort, but also a kind of blindness. We get so used to things, we stop actually seeing them. Now, with Christmas traditions, it leads to us doing things without always understanding why we are doing them. And once we've lost the understanding, changes can start to occur that move us away from the original meaning and intention. Now, Fred and I the other day were discussing just this topic. Specifically, we were talking about the famous an entirely fictitious innkeeper that shows up in so many Christmas pageants. You see, if you actually read any of the nativity stories of the Bible, you will find no mention of an innkeeper. This is because you'll actually find no mention of an inn. Now, if you'll indulge me in a quick Greek lesson, the word used in the nativity story in the Bible is katharuma, which means sleeping place or guest room. This is not the word used to describe the actual inn in the story of the Good Samaritan. He takes the injured man to a pen of Chion. However, the word Kataluma is used to describe the upper room, where Jesus and the disciples have the Last Supper. Now, it became fashionable to set Mary and Joseph as outcasts. So instead of giving use of the lower part of a relative's house because the guest room was full, the story changed. And they were turned away from an inn and stuck in a stable. Now this change has even crept over to the words used in connection with the Last Supper, as it is now sometimes depicted as a banquet hall and not as is actually written, being in a believer's home. Now this greatly changes the feel of the nativity. Instead of a tale of being welcomed into a person's home and given a warm, quiet, and most of all, private place to stay in, the picture is painted of two outcasts going from door to door, being denied entry and left to seek shelter in a barn. Now, maybe for some of you, I have just said something new about the gospel and shocked you with some new information. Or maybe you already are aware of how our traditions have crept away from the reality of what is actually written in Scripture. In either case, the problem of familiarity still presents itself. If we know something too well, we stop looking at it closely, and we don't see what is really there. Now, last year, I discovered a new Christmas movie. Actually, there were quite a few new ones that came out last year. And I mean actually, not just retelling the same old stories. Now, this is really exciting me because it was so unique and novel. I immediately bought the DVD and shared it with anyone who would watch it. Now, this movie wasn't the works of Shakespeare, nor would it any, win any Academy Awards. But its newness, especially in the context of a Christmas movie, made it something special. Now, just the other day, I discovered another new Christmas thing. 
But this one was actually an old thing that had been forgotten. J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, and along with our beloved C.S. Lewis, virtually invented the fantasy novel, wrote a Christmas poem in 1936. This was submitted to a contest and then promptly forgotten. Forgotten, that is, until in 2013, when a copy of the magazine was found and the poem was republished. It is both entirely new and at the same time entirely familiar. And I want to read it for you now. Noel. Grim was the world in gray last night. The moon and stars were fled. The hall was dark without song or light. The fires were fallen dead. The wind in the trees was like to the sea, and over the mountains teeth. It whistled with bitter cold and free, as a sword leapt from its sheath. The Lord of Snows upreared his head, his mantle long and pale. Upon the bitter blast was spread, and hung o'er hill and dale. The world was blind, the boughs were bent, all ways and paths were wild. Then the veil of cloud apart was rent, and here was born a child. The ancient dome of heaven sheer was pricked with distant light. A star came shining white and clear, alone above the night. In the dark, in the dale of dark, in that hour of birth, one voice on a sudden sang. Then all the bells in heaven and earth together at midnight rang. Mary sang in this world below. They heard her song arise. Or midst and over mountain snow to the walls of paradise. And the tongues of many bells were stirred in heaven's towers to ring. When the voice of mortal maid was heard, that was the mother of heaven's king. Glad is the world and fair this night with stars about its head. And the hall is filled with laughter and light. The fires are burning red. The bells of paradise now ring with bells of Christendom. And Gloria, Gloria, we will sing that God on earth is come. Now, it's not a song, but it's certainly new, at least to me. And I'd be willing to bet to the majority of you. I wanted you to have the experience of hearing something new, something for the first time. How did it feel? Did you pay a bit more attention to the details? Listen a little more closely to the actual words. How would you have reacted if I had started, "'Twas the night before Christmas," or even started reading the Nativity from Luke? You would immediately recognize what I was reading and know what I was going to say. You would probably go into autopilot and either tune out or hear the words as you already know. Now, it's not unlike the times when we switch to write one when you're used to the language of write two, and instead of responding, and with thy spirit, you kept yourself automatically saying, and also with you. Now, you might not think that I can hear you up here, but I do notice it. Now, it just, it is just what happens when you're too familiar with something. You can say the words, perform the actions without thinking. And that is where the trap lies. If we don't have to think about something, we usually don't. And why would we put any extra effort unless we were aware of this trap and seek to avoid it? This is why it's so important, important to take on the frankly hard task of approaching the gospel as a new song every time we interact with it. To put aside our assumptions and automatic interactions and give it our full intention. Let the words of Scripture say something new to you each time you interact with them. If we can make that an expectation, then we will be that much closer to avoiding the trap of familiarity. So, whether the words are entirely new or 2,000 years old, this Christmas season, I invite you to sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord and bless His name. To God be all the glory, now and forever.